Welcome to the second episode in a Legendarium series about the Mycenaeans. In this episode, First Kings of the Greeks, we will talk about how the Mycenaean kings created a sense of mystique around monarchy by using both craftsmanship and tombs built in Cyclopean architecture. They also increased their wealth through a trade network run by the Minoans, which brought not only trade goods, but distinctive war equipment. And the trade network also brought new ways for the Mycenaeans to worship old gods. As the Mycenaean kings extended their power across southern Greece through the 15th century BC, it's not surprising that their palaces grew as well. They had walls 50 feet tall and 47 feet thick. Gatehouses often included three massive stone blocks that framed the entrance of the gates, often guarded by stone lions. To enter the Megaron, a large rectangle-shaped hall where the king held court, visitors had to pass through two vestibules where sentries protected the king. And to further guard the king, the throne would be on a side wall rather than directly in line with the entrance, so anyone who smuggled in a weapon would not have an easy shot. The royal hall also included a large hearth, often 10 feet in diameter, big enough to roast an ox. Four columns in the center of the hall held up the corners of a skylight that allowed smoke from the fire to escape. To fill men with awe at the royal presence, the king used theatrical tricks. First, he used the echo of his hall to make the crackle of his roaring fire extremely loud to frighten visitors. To present guests with a strong but sweet smell, he poured incense onto the fire, sometimes so much that men became dizzy. And since kings painted their walls with animals and visitors saw those paintings through a sunlit smoky haze, they would have wondered if wandering animal spirits filled the king's hall. Workmen even painted the columns in red zigzag patterns that appeared to move in the smoky sunlight. Floors painted in square panels made the room appear even larger. All of these tricks made one wonder if one had entered the presence of a god. A second, smaller hall called the Queen's Megaron included private apartments, including some set aside for scribes, storage facilities, and the making of arms and armor. To build walls, workmen used a style of building called Cyclopean. They used large, mostly uncut stone blocks that were moved into position by being transported on greased logs and then winched into place with cranes, much like Stonehenge. This building style would be called Cyclopean because later people believed that only the Cyclops could possibly be strong enough to move such huge blocks. On the inside, builders covered the walls with plaster, which was then painted with animals. On the outside, it was covered with limestone blocks to protect against battering rams and people trying to climb up. The paintings on the inside of the Megaron included both fantastic and real things, ranging from plants to griffins to lions to battle scenes, chariots, and boar hunts, the preferred pastime of the Mycenaean aristocracy. But Mycenaean engineers didn't just build for the king. They also made stone bridges for crossing rivers and dams to aid in flood control. After all, that meant more farmers, that meant more produce, and thus more wealth for the king. The Cyclopean style was also used to build Pholos tombs as burial places for deceased royalty. Some of the stones involved in these constructions could weigh up to a hundred tons and would have to be dragged for miles by teams of laborers. Toilers built beehive-shaped tombs out of massive stones with pebbles and small rocks filling in the spaces between. No mortar was used in Cyclopean architecture. Stone cutters cut into natural hills, excavating the mound course by course and moving stones into place so that they supported the hollowed-out hill. 
of the structure only the upper part of the dome appeared above ground, more like a hill that would be recovered with earth and grass. Of all the Cyclopean tombs, the largest was the Treasury of Atreus, named after the legendary king said to have fathered Agamemnon. It included green stone half columns and red stone veneers that framed the doorway all hauled from 60 miles away. And while the domes were supposed to remain hidden forever, robbers from the later Greek and Roman eras realized that these perfect round hills were not natural, and soon they plundered them. In total, scholars know of 127 such tombs across southern Greece. Of course, the Mycenaean states benefited from being close to Minoa, the Cretan center of the late Bronze Age trade network. Copper, tin, gold, and ivory all came through the Mycenaean palace states in great amounts. Indeed, Mycenaean palaces became known as the workshops of the late Bronze Age, receiving raw materials like ivory and gold, and then exporting finished cups, goblets, and jars. Mycenaean wine and oil also traveled in giant clay pots called amphorae to Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Levant, and as far west as Sicily. Yet more than just goods came through. It brought the war kings into contact with North Africa, and Mycenaean warlords came to employ Egyptian and Nubian mercenaries in their armies. Indeed, if peace broke out in Greece, young aristocrats might make their way to Africa to earn fame and wealth for themselves, serving as mercenaries for African kings. But Minoan influence didn't stop with trade, it also extended to the fine arts. Mycenaean artisans soon picked up the Minoan passion for natural forms and flowing designs, but the mainlanders often adopted geometric designs to decorate their cups, along with spirals and rosettes. Pottery shapes at first looked much like their Minoan counterparts, but soon the Mycenaeans came up with their own creations, like the goblet and the squat jar. The Mycenaeans continued to make terracotta figurines of animals and women, much like those made during the Neolithic, except now they were made with ivory, stone, and even gold. While the early contacts between Minoans and Mycenaeans were mostly peaceful, and Minoan culture and trade goods swamped the mainland, Minoans did bring one distinctive part of the Mycenaean war kit to Greece. Now, while a Mycenaean warrior could count on a shield to cover most of his body, his head remained open to blows in close combat. So the Mycenaeans created a Minoan-style helmet reinforced with boar tusks shaped by craftsmen into smaller pieces, bored with holes, and then stitched together on a cone-shaped leather frame. The craftsmen took great care to alternate the curves of these tusks in concurrent rows to maximize its strength. Afterwards, the armorers added a plume or knob to the crown of the helm, and some of the models even included cheek guards. Indeed, in the Iliad, Homer made detailed descriptions of boar tusk helmets worn during the Trojan War. Homer even mentioned that the Mycenaeans had gained the tusks through hunting boar. Now, while the mainland Greeks had their own pantheon before they came into contact with the Minoans and they continued to worship them afterwards, the islanders did much to change the way that Mycenaeans worshipped. Curiously, the Mycenaean pantheon probably came to them from the Hittite Empire, which was ruled over by the storm god and the sun goddess. In time, the Hittite storm god very likely became the Greek king of the gods, Zeus, wielder of the thunderbolt. Little is known for certain about Mycenaean religious practices beyond animal sacrifices, community feasts held during sacred days, and the pouring of libations on the ground for the dead. The Mycenaeans took the double axe from Minoan religious art, but the mainland kings probably saw them not just as symbols of religious authority, but political authority. Indeed, during the late Bronze Age, there was very little distinction made between the two. 
Royal megarons or halls also functioned as centers of worship. Most palace centers had sanctuary sites intended for worship as part of the palace. Sometimes, kings even built altars in their great halls, where they sacrificed animals in the hopes that the gods would grant them favor. Another reminder of just how little difference there was between political and religious authority during this time. And of course, the relatively simple burials of the Neolithic era became far more grand during the Bronze Age. A vast cache of grave goods was buried with kings, including masks, diadems, jewelry, and ceremonial swords and daggers with elaborate decorations. And in the next episode, we will talk about how real swords and daggers were used in an episode about Mycenaean War. That wraps things up for this installment of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you saw, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thank Thanks again for joining me and I hope you have a great rest of the day.